half in the bag. Did you know if you stretched out all the videotape in the world in one continuous line, it would reach the Andromeda galaxy? And that's just Jerry Maguire. Did you hear the big news, Mike? No, what's the big news, Jay? They're making a TV series based on my favorite Star Wars character, Cassian Andor. Who? Isn't that Han Solo and Hoth gear? This is Cassian Andor. In... Who? What movie is that from? Star Wars. Which part? The part when they're on the Death Star? Yes. The part where they're on Tatooine? Yes. Who? What is that? What is that? I mean, I know it's an action figure, but who is that? It's Cassian Andor. Who? I can't wait for more Star Wars adventures with Cassian Andor. Cassian Endor? Maybe he'll go to Endor. Maybe that's how he got his last name. Oh, there you go. That's like the only thing you can draw upon. Yeah. His name sounds like Endor. Maybe he came from Endor. He grew up with Ewoks. He was raised by Ewoks in the woods. That's how he became such a good, like, like underground fighter. And then he died. Who? What, why didn't they make a movie with Jin Erso? That's true. Why'd they have to make a TV series about the white guy? He's a Hispanic, Jay. Oh, I think I'm confused. Imagine what the first... I honestly think I'm confusing you with a different character from Rogue One. Really? I think so. Okay, but yeah. <laughs> it's funny you should mention this because this, is, this, this little toy we have here at our lightning fast VCR repair shop, and whenever anybody comes by, you know, Jim and Colin or... Our, our friend Rich Evans, yes. special guests who may have stopped by, I say, name the character. And you just get a blank stare. Nobody remembers. Nobody so remembers. What a great thing to base the TV show on. <laughs> I think, do you think, I, do you think I they think started that, at the top of the Rogue One cast with like Felicity Jones and they said, do you want a TV show? And she's like, I'm busy on other projects. Yeah, yeah. And they just went oh. down the list mm. and then he was the only one who was like, yeah, I'm free. They asked Donnie Yen and, <laughs> and he's like, fuck no. <laughs> I, th I think they make it a little soft for when, like, bearded fat guys shove this up their ass. It's easier for the doctors to get out. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Oh, Cassian. Well, you can't spell Cassian without, you know. <laughs> In. Well, Jay, let's get, <laughs> let's get to what we're, what we're here for today. Look, he's tiptoeing. <laughs> <laughs> Can we stop talking about Star Wars now? We have a Boba Fett show coming out and a Cassie Nandor show. I think they're moving away from movies, uh, which which we'll talk about today. They're, they're moving into uh, streaming services, which have been very successful outside of Netflix. Remember CBS All Access? Who's the other one? Who's the community one? That was, uh, they started a stream, Yahoo was it? The Yahoo streaming service? What a hit. Well, I guess since we're talking about streaming, we'll talk about our first movie, TV show, whatever. It's a hybrid now. The Haunting of Hill House. Oh no! <laughs> that was perfectly timed. Now I want you two to get good rest. What if I have a bad dream? Netflix presents The Haunting of Hill House, a short-run TV series based on the 1959 gothic horror novel of the same name. Hey, why are Mike and Jay talking about a TV show? Why aren't they talking about the TV show that I wanted them to talk about? Why are they talking about this TV show? Talk about the movie that I want them to talk about. Why are you talking about this? Talk about something else. Talk about the thing that I want you to talk about. Here's a tweet. Talk about the fucking Freddie Mercury movie. Here's another tweet. Talk about Westworld. Here's another tweet. Talk about a thing that I want you to talk about. Anyway, wait! Is this a TV show or just a really, really, really long movie? Who cares? Eat my ass! So Jay, you watched The Haunting of Hill House and I'm surprised you watched that. Why would you be surprised? I like, I like spooky ghosts, atmospheric stuff. You seem to be this, more this of This sort the, of is that. You seem to be more of the, I like watching people get ripped apart by cannibals and, and skull fucked. And, That's not true. Yeah, you're- I mean, I, I, I do enjoy yeah. that stuff, but I like a, a, a classy old fashioned ghost story too, when it's told really well. Okay. Yeah, well, and I'm a big fan of the director of this, Mike Flanagan. Uh, he directed my favorite movie of last year, which was Gerald's Game, also for Netflix. 
He directed Oculus too. He directed which is Oculus. Surprisingly good movie. Um, he's he he just keeps making stuff. I feel like he's got two things coming out a year. He's doing another Stephen King adaptation next year, the semi sequel to The Shining, Doctor Sleep, which apparently is about growing up Danny Torrance uh, hunting vampires. Good luck making that work. But let's talk about a ghost show that we both watched, The Haunting of Hill House. Okay. Based on the 1959 gothic horror novel by... Shirley Jackson. Jackson. Shirley Jackson, yeah. which I've never read this novel. Which but was adapted into The Haunting, the movie. Um, and then the remake. Yeah, well, that was the remake. Well, the Liam Neeson one, I watched the trailer for it, and it was I like, saw that in the theater, and it was, like, awful. Oh. Yeah. He, he's like, he's like I'm, I'm having a bunch of people come to this haunted house for a sleep study about paranormal. Yeah. And, and it was There's like... There's lots of, like, CGI effects. Yeah. There's, like, late 90s effects. And it's like, this isn't scary. <laughs> You know what, Jay? I don't really want to talk about this too much. Okay. Because I don't want to spoil anything. Oh, sure. I mean, I know we say spoilers and we say, you know, move to this time code or whatever. It's, but har it's harder when you're talking about something that's like eight hours long. Yeah. <laughs> because after watching this, I felt like I had just read a very long novel. Yeah. This, 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 you get that, that feeling of like like cozying up under a blanket, sitting by a fire, reading a book. But this yeah. is the... the you know, cinematic version of that. Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I know there have been long-form TV shows, you know, like 10 episodes, and but this really feels like kind of like a, a change, of course, in, in entertainment a little bit because the reason why a feature film is two hours is because that was roughly the amount of time that they figured someone would sit in a theater for <laughs> before having to go to the bathroom. Sure. And now it's just the standard. I mean, early films like shorts and, you know, whatever were super short. Yeah. But then once this... Well, they, they used to be just you would go in and sit and watch for a while and then you'd leave. And you'd see maybe two or three shorts or whatever. There yeah, was no, it was different. But then yeah. once they're like the feature film, you know, <clears throat> people want to come in and they want to watch a movie. Um, and so they watch it for two hours. Three hours is too long, an hour is too short. Yeah. Two hours is just right. That's how long you can sit there and watch a movie for. But now everything's different. I can't imagine someone trying to tell the story in a feature-length film format. Yeah, condense all this down, yeah. all these characters to two hours. Right. Um, and that's there's the other Netflix series called Maniac with Jonah Hill and Emma Stone, and that's the same thing where it doesn't feel like a season of a TV show because it's not left open-ended. And I think people are getting tired of, you know, now that we're having more options available, stuff like this. Because I think about, like, The Walking Dead. Like, the first season of The Walking Dead was great. And then you're like, oh, this is just going to keep going, and no one's going to grow, and no one's going to change, and there's going to be no conclusion. Character might get killed off here and there. But you watch The Haunting of Hill House or Maniac, and it's like, uh, you feel like you've watched a completed story. Yeah. But you've watched one that has enough time to really, I mean, every episode focuses on a different character. This is this family, this sort of fractured family. Yeah. Um, and it really it gives everybody enough time to flesh them all out and, and really like make you understand them and care more about what's happening. Well, and that's another thing, the old model of television. It's like a, it's like a merging of the two because you, you, like you reference Walking Dead, a TV show that's on broadcast television, the purpose of it is to have five ad breaks. Yes. <laughs> and the purpose of it is to go as long as humanly possible until you have to end it. Right. So that you can have... Until they're not making enough money where it's worth it, and then the show's done. Uh, or until you hit 100 episodes and it can go into syndication. Yeah. Um, so you have a show, and it's like, okay, well, let's do another season. Let's do another season. Let's do another season. Yeah. And, and you're not, like, you've got a concept, and you move forward with a concept. Mm -hmm. When you have something like The Haunting of Hill House, it's a solidified story, you're done with it. And sure, uh, things make money on streaming services, people sign up to watch it. Something yeah. like Orange is a New Black is an example. It's something that's based on a book. Yeah. And then it's like, yeah, we're done with the book. We can keep, yeah, keep going. We're with, <laughs> we can keep going because people like it. Yeah. That's fine. But um, yeah, you, you have a, like a sitcom or just a long running series like, you know, Star Trek or whatever, like yeah. new adventures every week. And the, the point was to sell ad revenue, yeah. to sell advertisements. You don't really sell advertisements on Netflix. No, People Netflix People subscribe is... to a service to watch programs. So right. if Netflix makes a haunting of Hill House and they're done with it, I say, that's great. 
what else you got? What else are you making? Uh, yeah. Make this other thing, and I'll, I'll stay on Netflix. They, they've definitely become, my opinion keeps going back and forth on Netflix, because a couple years ago, I feel like we were talking about how they've been doing all these original movies, and they're all, like, fantastic, and uh, sometimes higher in quality and, and execution than theatrical movies. Mm -hmm. But then, very quickly, it became oversaturation, it became quantity over quality. Um, but then you still have something like this, you know, where it's it's really well done. So it's just, it's a mixed bag, but I think it is just sort of, yeah, like to have as many options as possible yeah. of things to watch. You get new subscribers all the time. Yeah. And if they're going to leave the filmmakers alone and let them basically do what they want and give them decent enough budgets, I mean, this and Maniac both feel more cinematic than a lot of movies that are in theaters. There's a couple kind of questionable CG moments, but for the most part, I mean, like the... The, the, the storytelling is ambitious, the, the uh, attention to detail and, you know, it, it, I mean, it does, you would not be able to see something like this on like a, because there was in the 90s, there was a lot of like the, the, the miniseries, there was mm -hmm. a lot of Stephen King, The Stand, which I would love to see Netflix do a new version of that, not that it could be done properly because the old TV version of The Stand sucks. Um, <laughs> But things like that, whereas like you had the occasional miniseries, and it was always like cheap and bad, and had 500 ad breaks. Did they make a mistake with it doing two feature films? <sighs> Maybe. I, I mean, that, you could have done that as a Netflix series, and just yeah. That book is 40,000 pages long, <laughs> and it's so intricate. Yeah. And you could you could probably make a 10 episode season from the first half of that book. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the thing. It's like if people are watching and people are subscribing to Netflix. And if it's good, I mean, that's you have those breakout, like, Stranger Things. It's the reason that caught on, because it felt, like, fresh and different. Uh, shit the bed in the second season, but it was super popular. Yeah. And now this is kind of broken through that same way. Would you wake us up from a dream like that? Oh, yeah, I think I read that they were going to try to do a season two. And see, that that's when you have... You start to come in with contradictions and problems, and it's like season two is going to be a whole new cast based on a whole other story. Is it still going to be the house? Oh, that's what you think. Like, what do you call the, it? the house is so intricate to this specific story. Right. <laughs> well, it's, it's like a, a American Horror Story is an anthology show, and each season they they have the same actors, but they're all playing different roles, and yeah. you know, and, and and but that's under the umbrella of a generic title, American Horror Story. So right. you can really go anywhere. But this, it's like, no, I know it's popular, and I know it's the temptation is there. Yeah. Because, but just leave it alone. Go find another book. Make yeah, a, I mean. You can't really, it's called The Haunting of Hill House. If you were to do more, it would have to be related to that house. But that house is like a metaphor with the season. I know, like, I know. <laughs> you can't yeah, do that. You can't do another show based on it. But yeah. The show, movie, whatever you want to call it, itself yeah. is lengthy. Uh, it it kind of reminded me of uh, uh, Six Feet Under mm. meets This Is Us. It's very character driven. Character driven. Uh, very dramatic. It's more of a character drama with like supernatural elements sprinkled throughout. Yes. Um, I think it peaks around episode five and six. And then after that, eh, not quite as strong. And then I think the message or theme of it gets a little muddled in the final episode. I mean, there's mis mystery elements to it and there's reveals along the way. Um, but the, the characters are all, I mean, that's where this, it's centered. Yeah. And, um, and was it episode six? That's the long take episode? That's the, the, yeah, yeah, it's three or four really long takes. Every shot was the product of a hundred people standing on each other's shoulders and having to execute dozens or hundreds of tasks. Uh, all this stuff happening in one shot and very, that seems to be a thing lately. Like uh, uh, the fucking Overlord movie had a extended long take shot and- uh, Saving time. <laughs> I guess. Uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom had one, and the Halloween movie had it's like a new trend, I guess. But this one, it's so intricate, and it's so like the camera just keeps moving, and there's parts when they swap out the adult actors with the child actors for just like one quick shot, and then it comes back around and they're gone. And I'm just thinking about like having to wrangle all these little kids, and that's they built the set specifically for that because it's like they're in the funeral home, and then the dad walks down a hallway, and next mm. thing you know, he's in Hill House. Uh, spooky stuff. 
I guess. Hidden ghosts. Hidden ghosts, which I, I honestly, I started seeing that pop up. People saying like, there's hidden ghosts. And I was like, I don't give a crap. I loved it. It's 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 kind of like, uh, it's, it's like begging for clickbait articles. Click here to see all the hidden ghosts. Like uh, it doesn't affect the story. I, 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 I was unaware of that. Story. I was unaware of clickbait articles. I just noticed like you see a face like looking through the window like yeah. at a, as the camera's panning by. It adds, it adds a little bit of atmosphere. It, 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 adds, it adds a little depth to the house because, you know, without like jump scares or oh look at this, you just know that the house is just, just filled with ghosts. Yeah, and and there's they're a, not there's a rich history to the house. They're not jumping it's... out, but there's some that are fainter than others in yeah. the distance. There's that one shot where they're like, I think I think it's in the long take episode where they're panning and you see the two 1920s ghosts mm -hmm. and they're just kind of there and then they're yeah. not there and. That's, that's the stuff that I find creepy is is like stillness when there's just someone just standing there or like uh, uh, there's a ghost that the, the little boy sees that's uh, got a cane. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but, he, but his feet don't touch the ground and he's just floating and it just goes on. It's like dead silent. There's no music. The, the, the purpose of it is not the jump scares or spooky imagery. It, it, it's really that that stuff is the... The icing on the cake. Yeah. The, the real stuff is the, is the family and the, the characters. Yeah. And so that's refreshing. It's it's the yeah the the kind of classic sort of ghost story where it's not about like freaking you out or being super scary. It's just this general like kind of tone of like melancholy and just being just this haunting because it's about this family that's basically it, it kind of reminded me of the Royal Tenenbaums, just less quirky about this family that's sort of split apart and then having to come back together. I said This Is Us. I haven't watched This Is Us. Is that the show where everybody's sad all the time? <laughs> Great job, Mike Flanagan. You did it. <laughs> Oculus, that was pretty good. He's good with actors. He always picks really good actors. Everybody. The only person I didn't like in this was the... Henry Thomas? No, Henry Thomas was fine. It was weird, though, because he's married to Carlo Gugino in this, who's also really good. And sh they were both in Gerald's Game. But in Gerald's Game, he plays her father in flashbacks. And he's, like, sexually abusive towards her. Ooh. And so then they're, like, married in this. I was like, good. But no, the one I didn't really like was the oldest son when they were children. He came across like like sitcom actor kid. Everybody oh, else felt okay. so like natural and good. He stuck out to me. Oh, well, Not that absolutely. I want to shit on a little kid actor, but he was he was the, what stuck out to me. But all of them as adults were really great. Uh, the two oldest sisters, the one that works in the morgue, and the one that has like psychic abilities. Who I rogue. think rogue. Rogue. Yeah, it's rogue. She has An to wear gloves. Angelina Jolie. Rogue. <laughs> <laughs> what didn't you like about Henry Thomas? I don't know. It was weird to have that character played by two actors because once you get to be like 40 ish you don't look that different in like yeah. 20 years yeah it, it, they, it, they got what's his name uh timothy hutton and they look very similar but it was still a little they have jarring similar eyes but yeah the age difference wasn't too dramatic yeah he needed you needed like i mean they had the kids were like four and eight and yeah. he needed to be like 30 and i think uh uh henry thomas is like 50? Probably, yeah, somewhere around. I mean, he was, what, 14, 13 in E.T.? Uh, 70, 80, 70, 69, 68, 68. It's probably 50. Yeah. 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. 50 Cent? <laughs> you got 50 Cent? <laughs> play it, play it. 50 Cent was in it. He was one of the hidden ghosts. That was Tupac. So 50 oh, Cent stole Oh, too mine. soon. Tupac and Biggie were in the background. Oh, okay. They went to have a rap battle at the haunted <laughs> house, and they got they got but got shot there. Maybe this will be what the second season's about. It's a whole cover-up thing. Okay. It's a theory. All right. It was written in 1959 <laughs> by Shirley a, Jackson. A rapper, a rapping artist, one who uses his words and. So Shirley Jackson is like the pop culture Nostradamus. She invented rap. Oh, okay. He uses words, lingo, along with beats, fat beats. In the ghost house, <laughs> his name is Tupac Shakur, and his fat arch rival, <laughs> Biggie. They rapped until they could rap no more. Then the house took them. We're not like any other family. We're different. Because of where we grew up, 
<laughs> would you know. would you recommend Haunting of Hill House? Absolutely. Yeah. I just want to so say I complaint. was I was happy that a story like this ended like that. And sure. and, and and you know, I, uh, spoilers. Uh, uh, something that doesn't end with the ghost getting everybody. Oh yeah. And the house starts shaking and the floor rips apart. The ending of like, what is it, Conjuring 2? <laughs> Everything's going crazy. Where, where there's that temptation. No, and... it's, it's all character driven, which I like. Um, I guess since we're in spoilers, I can mention it now. It turns out that like, there's that one locked room and that turns out to be like a, a different room for everybody. And mm -hmm. it's very like uh, metaphorical. Yeah. Uh, but then it turns out that like the house is sort of, you're, you, you're, you live on in that house. Your spirit lives on, your memory lives on, which seems like, I don't know, it seems like leading up to that, it's all about people sort of letting go of their grief and their tragedy and their, their ill feelings towards each other. Uh, uh, but a lot of their grief also stems from being in that house it did so it's like it did but now it's all it's all ended yeah and it's all tied up and now they can move on okay. and it, you know so i mean what ghost stories like this end with a happy ending yeah where it's not just in the house won in the end come back i dare you <laughs> you know it was it was it was refreshing yeah. netflix remake the stand I want to see a good version of The Stands, not that shitty made-for-TV one from the 90s. Got a whole pile of books for you to make Netflix. Don't make Adam Sandler movies anymore. <laughs> Although there's a market for that, apparently. That's that's why they do it. So Netflix yeah. is like, is, is there an audience for this specific thing? Boom. Consumer choice. More choices for the audience to watch products. And uh, our, 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 the next choice that we made to watch was a little film called Overlord. Bam! It's Overlord! From director Julius Avery, a director of one other movie, comes the most tastefully done film about Nazi zombies ever made. A group of soldiers drop into France ahead of D-Day to take out a radio jamming tower and discover something terrible. Nazis are creating super soldier zombies, hot damn look out! <laughs> Mike, what did you think of Overlord? Yeah, you know what, I didn't even see a trailer for it. I was vaguely familiar. Uh, you, you said there's a movie coming out and I said, Okay. Well, I think at one point it was supposed to be a, a related to the Cloverfield universe. I thought I, that was what they were saying back when Cloverfield Paradox was coming out. It's like, this is coming out, and then later this year there's another Cloverfield World War II movie. And then everybody hated Cloverfield Paradox, so they're like, maybe we should drop this. This Cloverfield This branding. Cloverfield uh, experiment has been a horrible failure. Let's yeah. just stop. Yes, yeah, stop brand <laughs> branding random movies with the Cloverfield title yeah it's, it's embarrassing it's but it's but it's bad robot the same company that did those yeah and i think that's kind of their because i think this is their first r-rated movie but i think that's their model is like give these filmmakers that don't have a lot behind them and just have them make a weird little sci-fi or horror movie and then we'll just release it i guess like well th this guy who made this uh he made one other movie and then he made this and now he's attached to direct Flash Gordon big budget remake. That's how it goes. So, but you know, great. Uh, I love this movie. It's good, yeah. Uh, this was like, I think my favorite movie of the last decade. <laughs> uh, um, I, <laughs> I'm gonna have to chalk that up to hyperbole. This movie's fine, it's entertaining, but it's ultimately a World War II Nazi zombie movie. Well, that's the thing is like, yeah, you'd expect, you'd expect schlock. Um, but it was it was just really well done. It rides that balance. I think we've talked about this before, how it's like when you're doing something that has a pretty ridiculous premise, you either have to take it seriously enough where it feels like a real movie or really embrace the schlock. Yeah. It's when people make movies that kind of try and ride that line where it's like it's kind of serious, but then there's something quippy or someone acknowledging how ridiculous their situation yes, is. Yes. This never does that. Right. It's just like Saving Private Ryan meets Reanimator. 
and they, they play it as straight as a, a World War II war movie without zombies would be. Right, right. <laughs> they put all their bets on, on taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. And you know what? They did a great job. And, and the screenplay was like, the guy who wrote The Revenant wrote the screenplay with somebody else who really? wrote a bunch of other like movies. Huh. Yeah, I mean, it's not like a hack job, which was surprising. Yeah. The characters were solid. The protagonist was great. Oh, every character had a well-defined purpose. Hmm? And, and it worried me a little in the beginning because uh, there's a really great opening where they're flying to France, yeah. you know, to, to airdrop in. And of course, at one point, Towards the end, they start, everything blows up and, you know, it goes badly as every airdrop before D-Day does, yeah. in movies at least. I'm sure there were ones that just went perfectly. That's not very cinematic, though. It's not very hey, cinematic. Hey, we did it. Everybody jumped down, everybody. <laughs> our, our plane did not get touched by, <laughs> by exploding flak in the sky. Yeah, that never happens in movies. No problems. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure it happened to some company in World War II somewhere, but <laughs> this one, of course, had the planes blowing up, but they set up like, uh, all the characters are talking, and I'm the guy with this. And but what the I liked about that before you get into it, what I liked about that scene is is the sound mix on the movie is so like you can barely hear their dialogue. They're like shouting at each other, but there's like the plane noise and you know everything going on outside, and it just felt more like natural and real than a lot of movies do when it comes to that type of stuff. Yeah. But but I mean, I'm like I was getting that flashbacks of that bus scene in that horrible Predator movie. Oh, it's like, I'm the guy yeah. who says this. And I'm this character. Uh, yeah, Here's yeah. my I trait. Like, I was like, no. Because there's the photographer guy. Yeah. I take the photos. But, but it worked. Hmm? It worked so well. Well, it was well written. It wasn't so on the nose. Over time, like, you know, it, it takes its time with everything. Hmm? The, our hero, Boyce. Yeah, I think so. He, he lands, and then he, you got uh, Kurt Russell's son. Playing Kurt Russell. Playing, yeah. <laughs> Snake Plissken Jr. That's um, what I was, I was so, it was so distracting through the whole movie because I've seen him in other things. Like he was in uh, Ingrid Goes West. He was Elizabeth Olsen's boyfriend in that. Oh, okay, okay. He was on an episode of Black Mirror. But this is the first time I've ever seen him go full Kurt Russell. Like if they ever, whenever they remake Escape from New York, which they'll do eventually, I guess just get him. But yeah, like him and then you, you got the Italian guy and you got the Jewish guy and then you got uh, Chloe, the girl from France and uh, her kid brother. And he just wants to play baseball with the Americans. Yeah, and it's it, it, just great. Just great. <laughs> and and our, our uh, voice, our protagonist is just like, He's your guy. Well, they establish at the beginning, they talk about him, he didn't want to kill a mouse or something, so that, of course, leads to his kind of turn later on. It's like a screenplay that's, that's formed. And... It's, it's like a flawless screenplay. <laughs> the, the only, like, if, if, if I were to, like, have some kind of criticism is, is you know, a little bit on the length. Uh, the part when uh, Boyce goes into, he kind of stumbles his way into the... N the Nazi. Um, oh yeah, when he finds their lab. Laboratory. He uh, a, a dog, random dog chases him, so he hides in a truck, and there's dead bodies. Yeah. And sort of like he goes from room to room, like sneaking around, like and discovering a little, everything. A little convoluted to get him to that point. Is that what you're saying? Well, and not that too, but and once he's in there, it's like okay, now he's looking at this, now he's looking at this, now, and then it's like okay, we got it. They're, yeah. They're doing an experiment. You know, this is going on way too long. Let mm. get get out of there. But like all the I think, stuff, I think that was the, maybe the length it was, just because up until that point, it was a pretty straight World War II movie, and they didn't really introduce anything supernatural or weird yet. So it's like, eh, let's give people enough time to soak this in. I was thinking of because uh, when he's stumbling around on there, you see like a severed head with a spinal cord, and it's like talking, and I was having like flashbacks to like Day of the Dead. It was one of those those scripts that took its time to build up mm -hmm. um, because they really like once they land, they really don't have many interactions with with the Nazis with with like shooting and war stuff. Yeah. You know, they 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 capture that general or commander guy and they kind of torture him, and it's, it's almost like it's it's building up to it. And then finally, when they get to the part where they 
start shooting at them. It's exciting. Yeah, they don't. They don't feel. I guess the opening is kind of an action scene, but it's like a typical war movie action scene. There's nothing like horrific right. about it. Yeah. I feel like a lot of, uh, I always think of the Evil Dead remake. The original Evil Dead, like they spend so much time of them getting to the cabin and getting from, before anything like crazy happens. And then in the remake, it's like that opening scene. Oh, Brett, you're so loud, you pathetic fuck! Demon Lady, just so you know this is a horror movie before we get boring for a while. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, just a movie that, that seems like it at least uh, respects the audience enough to know that they'll wait for the, the, the craziness to start. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's the thing, is that the boring stuff wasn't boring to me. No, it was fine. It, it was it, like, if you didn't have zombies in this, it would still be a well-done action yeah. World War II movie. I think part of it, too, was an effective ticking clock element, which was we got to blow up the tower by 6 a.m. Yeah. Because the, the troops are coming in to the beach, and, and they're not going to make it unless we blow up that tower. And so that's running in the back of your mind. Yeah. And so they're dealing with all these problems of their company is scattered and mostly all dead. And they're trying to hide in this little French village and they, they're outnumbered. So yeah. you have like all those typical like war plot things. And then on top of that, they <laughs> and then the zombies show up. And that too, like the little French village, it felt very like, I don't know, like, I don't know if iconic's the right word, but you had the little French village with the, uh, the, the church on the top of the hill. And that's, that's where they have to get to. And it just all felt very like classic movie stuff that all fit together like a puzzle. It felt like a movie that w could have been made 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. Because it didn't get it didn't go off the rails and go crazy. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it stuck to its plot. And it was, yeah, it was also refreshing to see a movie that, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but had kind of low aspirations. Yes. As far as, and, and like, I didn't, you know, really recognize anyone other than Kurt Russell's kid. It's all a bunch of people you don't really know. They've all, I'm sure they've all done other stuff, but no big names. Mm -hmm. It just felt like, like, this is our story. <laughs> We're going to tell this. We're not going to have the the huge over the top action ending. We're not going to introduce like too many too many like B plot lines. It's just boom. It's so straightforward. It was a really good action movie. Mm -hmm. Like it got it, instead of being like overbearing and noisy and awful. It the you action was by exciting the action. and yeah. and well that's because you you understood their goal. It was so clear cut. Yeah. And you cared about it. Uh, was it Rosenberg and Tibbet? Uh, were those the two guys up on the hill? The Jewish guy and the Italian guy. Yeah, yeah. They were the two that, that had to provide the cover fire. Yeah. While they were trying to lure Nazis out so that they could thin out the number in the base so that, you know. There's a strategy. There, yeah. So what was happening? So that uh, Kurt Russell Jr. and <laughs> um, Boyce, they needed to blow up the tower, but at the same time, you know, they also had to rescue the little boy and blow up all these bad Nazi zombies. Yes. Destroy this laboratory. Um, so you have those two characters that are providing cover fire and they're running around and I was like, oh, I care <laughs> if, if either of these two characters die. No. And, and I was like, oh, that's great. I, I feel something. Establish stakes. And I, and I just kept thinking back to that Predator movie Ugh. at the end when it was just like this just mess. It's just nonsense. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I don't give a fuck what's going on. Just end. Right. End movie. And some scary moments that the one that one creepy zombie that's attacking Chloe and the in the room when she's by herself. You know? Oh, yeah, the it's, weird, the weird, uh, he's like bald KY and, jelly yeah, zombie. He has like kind of like a toxic Avenger face. <laughs> and, uh, it didn't go crazy with the zombies. I kept waiting for that. I was like, OK, we're starting more grounded. And then once we introduce the zombies, oh, then we're going to get crazy action and more like, I don't know, Evil Dead 2 schlock or something, which I love Evil Dead 2, but that's a different type of movie. They, yeah, no, they, they never went too far. They had restrictions on what they could do. And, yeah. and maybe this was a lower budgeted film because it was intended for Netflix, you said? I don't know. Oh, I, no, that's, that was my thought. It was oh. like, because it, it's like a mid budget. I want to say it's like around 30 million or something, which okay. they don't make movies in that budget range anymore, but yeah. this was. It, it, it didn't. It didn't get over bloated with nonsense. Mm -hmm. And they had two locations. They had their base, the little like, I think it was a church, right? Yeah. 
and it was there were, you know caverns and bricks and the little underground tunnels and then they had their little French village and then the inside of the girl's house yeah it was but great. There, there, there was a story to justify where they were and why they were there. Yeah, they didn't. You, you don't need a lot of locations if you're actually invested in the story. Like we said, strategy. Like these characters are here. They have to get here to do this, and here is their strategy to do so. Oh no, there's these zombies in the way. Like, how much better can you make a Nazi zombie movie than this? I don't think you can. I think this is this is this is the top of the heap. <laughs> And you look at the sub, sub, sub genre of Nazi zombie movies. This is the gold standard. This is the gold standard. It's true. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it's unfortunate because it's like, I'm sure uh, people say, what's that Overlord movie about? Well, that's what's interesting, too, it's, is that oh, it's just like this random movie. It's not a, a larger story. It's not connected to anything else. It's not being too heavily marketed. Like, I, don't, I haven't heard much about it, even. It's just like this little movie. Like, hey, this came out. Yeah. So, I don't know. I hope it does well. Go go watch Overlord. Go watch it. This is a weird little one that deserves some support. And there's a lead-in for a sequel. Oh, yeah, I suppose. I just saw that as a cute little, the war goes on kind of thing. And then we end with a Nas song for some reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some rap music starts. <laughs> that was cool. I guess that's that's the uh, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but that's your your Rage Against the Machine ending. You could end with just score from the movie, but no, you leave them exiting the theater with a Rage Against the Machine song playing, and everyone's like, "Yeah!" You wow them in the end. Yes, yes. That's a, that's my uh, that was my Avatar experience. The, it's two and a half hours of the most complicated uh, effects driven movie ever and then it kind of ends and someone goes oh that sucked <laughs> it's because it didn't end with a rage against the machine song <laughs> <laughs> and then it's those marvel credits yeah you, know, you got to have those end credits you can't just black with titles unless it's some depressing drama movie right but everything's got to end with some kind of animation yeah <laughs> and this did some sort of montage of all the props from the movie, which I thought was cool. Yeah, it was more subtle than, yeah, yeah it wasn't just whoosh, like whoosh, blood splatters and <laughs> yeah, monsters. Yeah. It was like the, they had the little flashlight, the military issue, World War II flashlight. It felt flashlight. kind of old timey. Yeah, and yeah. And the opening title too, when it, when oh, it just yeah. says Overlord and takes up the entire fucking yeah. screen. But it had and then the, the little copyright on the, the bottom. The classic copyright. Because yeah. it started in black and white. Yeah. And it kind of faded into color. And I think at that first start, I was expecting this to be more of like a, like a Robert Rodriguez, like Planet Terror, Grindhouse kind of thing. Thing. At the very beginning, that's kind of what I was expecting. I was like, uh, but then it turns out to be a solid movie. There was no female Nazi dominatrix. Yes, yeah, they didn't go full schlock. Tight fucking script. <laughs> you don't see that anymore. Yeah, yeah. So go watch Overlord! And get ready to watch the Cassie and Andor TV show. I can't wait for that. All right, Mike, well, let's get back to work fixing VCRs. Yeah.